Hey everybody, welcome to the Blender Report, where news meets rational thinking. I'm your host, Jonathan Harvey. This is your co-host, Liam DeBoer. Liam, what's up, dude? Not too much, brother. Uh, today we're going to be chatting about Bill S-210, which is the most invasive, privacy-threatening, internet-freedom-suppressing, anti-free speech legislation <laughs> yet. You like that? <laughs> <laughs> the NDP liter- uh, leader Jagmeet Singh threatening to end his coalition with Trudeau's liberals. Elon Musk's accusation about Biden's immigration policy, as well as the UN saying that melting Arctic ice is a key indicator of climate change, despite it not actually melting Uh, but before we get into things if you wouldn't mind giving us a kind review on spotify or subscribing to our youtube channel that would be greatly appreciated all right let's get into it so first off we've got bill s210 so canada is considering passing this bill which would supposedly limit children's access to adult content online however it is being criticized as invasive and a threat to internet freedom introduced by a senator julie milvell deschen the bill aims to shield children from premature exposure to explicit content, but is deemed flawed. Critics, including privacy lawyer David Fraser, label it as a, quote, clear and present danger to internet openness. Concerns arise over potential requirements for government ID and facial scans for online access. So, Jonathan, where do you think this bill could go wrong? Uh, um, so I did a little bit of research on this. I'm going to have to do a little more uh, because I think I'm going to do a longer format video on it. Every time something like this comes up that's like heavy into censorship, I like to dig in and kind of try to understand really what they're getting at because they always pitch it as one thing, like all for a good cause. And then there's all this sort of more back end nefarious use for it. And look, I know people, they're like, oh, take the tinfoil hat off. Don't be a conspiracy theorist. The reality is, I'm not. I'm just. This is exactly what they've done continuously. They put in these things, you know, under the guise of X when really it's what it's for for Y reason, whatever it may be, right? So one of the things interesting about this that I know so far is they're thinking about implementing not only that you have to use a government issued ID to log on, but they'd be scanning your face because a lot of us have, you know, some sort of camera technology, whether it's phones or computers, and that's just for access to these websites. There's a lot that can go wrong there. First of all, they want to keep all this information on some database that the government controls. And I mean, how many times do do people get hacked around the world and lose millions and millions of dollars? Now, I'm not super concerned about people having my private information for the most part. But when you think about that at scale um, and how risky that is and what that means for society, I mean, right there, that's, that's super dangerous. And then, you know, the other thing here that I picked up from the bill was that the intention is to safeguard children, right? from porn. That's the whole idea. Safeguard children from porn. But the language in the bill so far is, is so is so um, open-ended. It's so loose. I mean, almost anything would fall under this. Like, you know, you and I write about things, you know, in the newsletter where we talk about stuff that, you know, is going on around the world. And if you, if you mention or show anything that has to do with it, it could be like a Sears magazine. You know what I mean? Like it's not, it's not about this being hardcore porn. It's literally a catch all. Right. Um, And my concern really is that this is just one more bill that they're putting in place to control the entire internet. You know, this is very much turning into China. And we say that and people think it's goofy, but like, if you kind of look at the playbook, we're just using different terms, we're doing the same thing. And one more thing that I I did pick up on so far was for those websites that were not willing to comply, so something that you and I would do, um, you'll be blocked in Canada from from people being able to access your website, which to me is, is wild. What else What else could go wrong? I don't know. What are your thoughts? To your point about looking at it as people saying, oh, take the tinfoil hat off or whatever, you got to look at these things in practice, not necessarily the stated intention behind why they're doing such things. Because anybody can justify any certain measures for any reason. And you see this all the time with government overreach where, yeah, sure, we might justify it in a different way than how another country is. So for instance, recently Putin uh, put in internet censorship stuff, but he said, you know, the CIA in America is trying to interfere with uh, our uh, national security. And so we're going to take these steps. They were a lot more uh, just straightforward with saying that, hey, it's it's a national security thing that we want to do this with. Again, whether that's their real intentions, who knows? But then on the other end here, we're implementing those same things, but our government says, well, we're doing it for the kids. If you're going to sit here and look at 
Putin and say that this is a overreach or that he's a tyrannical leader and he's putting these measures in place, but then we're doing the exact same thing just for different reasons. Again, it just comes down to how does this stuff operate in practice? And you've seen even recently over the last couple of decades with like the Patriot Act in America, where they, after 9-11, they said, well, we need to increase all of this internet, uh, surveillance and see you uh, be able to look into everybody's emails and where they're going on websites and all this stuff so that we can stop acts of terrorism before they happen again and what they ended up doing was creating the largest surveillance state humanity has ever known it's just a, a bait and switch like you were saying and i think the oddest part is just seeing this is one of those things this is just another one of those policies that you see being implemented across all of our countries almost in identical lock and step. So you can look at even Nikki Haley down in the States, who is obviously captured by the quote unquote establishment. And she's been pushing for government ID to say, get onto social media sites and other, other internet sites as well. And it's, to me, it's just like the likelihood of these politicians in completely different countries that ha are trying to appeal to different voting bases with different, incentives and trying to implement the exact same policies at the same time it just doesn't line up with the whole narrative that they would just be trying to appeal to their voting base right i think the other thing too when you look at this bill like the nuts and bolts of it okay well, we, we don't want kids to watch porn got it but you know there's a reasonable amount of studies that say um it's not good it's not good for kids at that age to be exposed to that. It, it, it rewires things in their brain because it's like they're getting the pleasure center of it without the work and all these other things, and it's too easy to access. And I understand. I, I actually don't disagree. You know, that being said, you've got parental controls on your devices. You've got parental controls on your internet at home. Um, obviously, they have them in schools and all these other places. So there are already things you can put in place to try to stop this from happening. But then at that point beyond that, there is no way to stop kids from finding these things. There's just no chance. Basically, it's a war on drugs. It's something you can't win. Kids will always find a workaround because they're smarter and better with these things than the government is anyway, which is wild, but it's true. I don't know. My mom told me when I was a kid that she set up some sort of thing that if we went on any adult sites, they would get an email and it fucking worked. I was like, I'm not letting my mom know that I'm looking at this. So that worked. But then it's one of those things right now, 20 years later, I'm helping her log into her Hotmail account. And I'm like, there's no way you knew how to set that up. That was a lie. Well, so so that's exactly it. Like you can try to outsmart your kids and you do it as long as you can to protect them. But I think again, like if kids want to find something, they're going to find it. They're going to find a way around it no matter what, because there, there's just like get a VPN. Like it's that simple. There's there's no way this works. You know what I mean? It's it's not it's not a practical tool. And when you see see, this is this is what gets me. When you look at something, you go, here's why we're doing this. And then I can sit here and go, well, that's not gonna work. And here's a here's a bunch of reasons why this is foolish. And you go, yeah, we're still going to do it because it's, it's good for the kids. Then I automatically go, okay, so that's not the reason you're doing it. Obviously, you're doing this for some other, some other secondary, whether it be nefarious or not, reason. You're not being honest with us. And then, like you said, when you compare these, when you compare these policies to Russia, it's the same thing wearing a different hat, right? At least there, they're being honest with you. I don't agree with any of it, but at least there, you're getting sort of the straight truth. And too, I, I do think there is something to be said about the the harms that like you were talking about with the studies showing how how terrible it is for child development <laughs> i also think even just even outside of children like there's there's people i've oh yeah uh, spent time with before where it's just like i can tell that you're a little disconnected in this space like that there is it, i think it does warp people's ideas of what an intimate relationship looks like well, you know what? There's actually, if if you look online, like I don't, I don't, I don't look for these things because I don't need to. And I, I just, you know, there's enough people you'll see on Instagram, for example, that are getting promoted from some other account that are. I really feel like I'm, I'm guarding myself here. Like I'm not involved <laughs> in this. I swear to God, I'm not. <laughs> um, there's not enough Terry Crews in it every day. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there's enough people. Uh, that make a living off of helping guys, young guys, stop watching porn. It's yeah. become like it's become like an addiction for a lot of people that kind of fucks your brain up, right? And I, these aren't kids necessarily; they're they're young adults. But like, it is a real problem, and I do think that it needs to be addressed. But once again, if you give it to the government to manage, it becomes a state-controlled problem or solution. It's not a solution. It's just something that they're using for some other purpose. That's just exactly what it is. So again, I feel like. 
it's frustrating. I feel like I never trust the government anymore, like at all. No. And, I, and I feel bad because like, when you say that as a blanket statement, you sound like a bit of an idiot. You sound a little conspiratorial. You sound like, oh, Jonathan, there's still some good people out there. I know that there are good people out there. It's just that when you look at the amount of money they spend, I don't even know if they use 10% of our tax dollars efficiently. When you look at all the policy that passes, I can literally poke a hole in every single piece of legislation as to why it serves another purpose. So I don't know, man. It, I don't I don't want to seem cynical. It's just, it, it just the way it sort of feels these days. I think it doesn't mean that every single one of the people involved in, say, these bureaucracies or processes has nefarious intentions, but I think a lot of them get captured by, say, the select few that would have nefarious intentions, and they buy the same line hook and sinker as well of, like, again, I, I've talked about this before, where in these authoritarian regimes, there's usually the inner party, and then there's what are called useful idiots. Right. And so it's like you have your select maybe 10 to 15 people in the party that really know what what things are being pushed forward for yeah but then they're then it's like okay what are we going to tell all of our soldiers to tell the right. masses right 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 yeah no I, I i agree i think a lot of people that work in these work in the as a cog in the machine day to day are good people you know um i don't think that they're doing it for the wrong reasons i think they're like hey i got job security and i'm trying to do the right thing totally it's not the individuals it's the machine that's the, the machine is poison you know what I mean? It's just the result of all these tools they implement. It just seems to give them more power and take away our individual freedom. But I think it is one of those things where if you're involved in that system, you can't operate from a, a place of ignorance because it, like ignorance isn't an, isn't an excuse. I'm not and, sure that I would say it's necessarily ignorance as much as they are being having the wool pulled over their eyes and, and not necessarily willingly or for a lack of doing their own research in a sense of just going, OK, so imagine you're imagine you work for the government, right? So you went to, say, U of T. Um, you, the ideology started there, for sure. You graduate, and then you jump right into the political sector. You're helping with campaigns. You're doing all this stuff. You're, you're a liberal because that's, that's how you were bred in school, right? So then you continue doing that, and you, 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 you work your way up, and now you're in your late 20s or something, and you land a job, like a good, reasonable job with the government, say, the provincial or the federal level. What does your, your, and your, and your access to information that whole time is mainstream media and the people that are around you and your education from school? It's all you know. Yeah. And, 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 you know, like, it takes a lot for people to, at, like, question everything they know in life, right? And I think that's something you and I have done, and that's what puts us in a bit of a different position. But, you know, until something really bad happens to that individual who's in their 20s, who's got a good job, who's always been around sort of that liberal mindset, paying attention to the mainstream media, until something drastic happens to them, there is no, no reason to question their reality. So I don't know that it's necessarily ignorance as much as, they're not. They're just not given access to. Well, the, ignorance is just the state of being unaware. Sure, or I, 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 I. You're right. I guess you want technically yes, but it comes with a bit of connotation like ignorance, like almost it feels like willful ignorance or that they're stupid. And I don't think it's either one of those. No, you know, and I've said this on the podcast before. It's easier to train a smart dog than it is to train a dumb one. Right. And, but I think too, even if you look at, let's say some terrible regimes in the past, most people will say, well, I was just following orders. Right. And it's like, yeah, but it's, I, I look at it as every single individual is responsible for their actions, no matter what the circumstances around them are. I agree. But then if you look at today, if you look at what's going on in today's world and how these pieces of legislation are moving through, which part, which person is doing something that you would deem unacceptable? Which person? Trudeau. <laughs> right. Me too. But he knows he is, right? Yeah. He know that guy knows he's a piece of shit. So um who in the who in 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 executing these these steps to bring this legislation into place, they're telling you it's for the kids. We're gonna stop them from looking at porn. We're gonna save your young kid, your young boy, we're gonna we're looking out for him, and you're implementing this policy. Who in that who in that line, that chain of operations Who's the person doing the wrong thing necessarily? All of them. Right, but how would you identify that? Because you're not hurting anybody. You're not killing anybody. You're not doing anything that society would deem unacceptable. So to identify yourself as a problem within the machine, you have to understand the nefarious purpose. Otherwise, you can't. Otherwise, you're like, oh, I'm, implementing, I'm implementing policy to save kids. You're welcome. Yeah. I should get paid more for this. That You know what I mean? They're not going, wow, I'm burning people in chambers. Like, you're not... You know what I mean? It, it, yeah, there's, yeah. There's, a, there's a very clear right and wrong in some of the regimes that have caused a lot of harm over time. And I think this one, what makes it unique and what I, what I have to give them credit for is they've fooled so many people within the machine that they're doing the right thing. And I think that's why they've maintained so much support. And again, I don't think they're necessarily 
evil. I, I like to believe that every single one of them is able to uh, redeem themselves, essentially, or be able to wake up to the fact that maybe they're operating in a system that isn't for the best interests of the people around them. But it is just, again, it's just, it's their own responsibility to do that. Nobody can do it for them. And there is a lot of times too, where, you know, even you and I have both dealt with it many times with people, whether it be people in those positions or whether it be people we know in our personal lives, where you lay stuff out to them wholesale, you say, here's, here's the evidence, here's exactly them saying why they want to do these things or what the goals behind these things are. And they'll still look you dead in your eyes and say, you're crazy or you're <laughs> fucked. Yeah. And it's just like, or, you know, even back in the two or three years ago when you would say, Hey, I think there might be some nefarious intentions going on, or at least they're not telling us the whole truth about this experimental medication that's being shoved down everybody's throats. And then not only will they say you're crazy, but then they say you're evil. You want grandmas to die. That was a good one. You want, you, <laughs> yeah, you know, that was a good one. Yeah, like, yeah. It's like, okay. So yeah, I, I, again, I, I agree, but it's just, it's about being able to get that message out to people. And I think that's another big thing that the government does is they they censor people like you and I. Our messages go, if I have a big video online, it gets a million views, which is great. You know what I mean? But the population of Canada is 40 million. That's just Canada, right? So it's a drop in a bucket, right? And and I know that my reach is more extensive than most in this space. And I still, it's still you still get just, you get smothered. You know what I mean? Like they've just done a good job of making sure whether it's algorithm, whether it's government, whatever it is, that th that this stuff doesn't really get talked about that much, unfortunately, right? Yeah, it's controlling the Overton window of, exactly. what's, of what's deemed acceptable. That's exactly it. It's just like one more tool they have, right? Yeah. So. All right, well, let's move on here to uh, the NDP leader, Jagmeet Singh, threatening to end the, his coalition with the Liberals. So uh, he has warned that the political alliance between the Liberals and NDP could crumble if the government fails to pass Pharmacare legislation by March 1st, 2024, which is about three weeks away. Originally due by the end of 2023, the deadline was extended due to disagreements. Singh insists he won't extend it further. The party's deal only requires, quote, progress towards a universal national pharmacare program, with the NDP pushing for a universal single-payer system, with the Liberals considering a model for the uninsured. So seeing as Trudeau is still only in power because of this pact, pretty much, do you see him forcing through this legislation in time? Yeah, of course. 100%. Like, look, the reality is what's best for Canada, that the $30 billion a year Pharmacare Act doesn't go through, uh, and that the coalition between the Liberals and the NDP falls apart. That's what's best for Canada, for sure. None of us, none of us really signed up for either one of these. And based on polls, a very small percentage, 17%, want the Pharmacare Act to be implemented. Um, more people actually are are strongly opposed to it as from a percentage perspective. And I don't know anybody in this country who signed up for an NDP liberal coalition, except probably people that voted NDP. You know what I mean? That's really it. Those are the only people that are winning, right? So what's best for Canada is that this falls apart. However, that being said, these two men have made themselves very, very powerful with this coalition. They've safeguarded themselves, right? You've got, I think the NDP was fourth. I don't even think they were third in terms of the, the overall votes and seats. Yeah, they were. I think they were behind the, the block. So you got first and fourth, but still a minority. And together, though, they make a powerhouse. And they've made themselves two of the most powerful men in this country, which without this coalition, they become very vulnerable, very exposed. And they're in a very precarious situation. NDP policy stops dead. And NDP policy never really had a chance anyway, right? Because NDP is never going to run our country. Not as long as you and I are alive. Not as long as this country makes any sense at all. So the fact that they're able to, to implement some policy at scale at the federal level, this is, the this, is, this is their heyday. This is the best time they've had, as long as we've been alive. So they don't, they don't want this to fall apart, not only for Singh, but for the NDP. And then with the liberals, I mean, Trudeau's a psychopath, right? And, you know, he's going to do whatever he can to hang on to power. This is just what they do. And, you know, I think the big, the big thing for Trudeau is he'll do anything he can to maintain power and to not be exposed. And I think he's just trying to buy himself time, like I've said before, to be sure he can implement some sort of UBI before the, uh, before the next election so that he's got a reasonable chance to win. So is there any chance this doesn't go through? Zero, zero chance. Zero chance. What are how your do you thoughts? think? How do you, well, how do you think they shove it through in less than three weeks? So he didn't say it had to be done. He said they wanted a bill. So it was very like Jugmeet's, what Jugmeet did was he go, they need to have a bill in place, not passed. They need to have something on the table that they sort of agree to. 
I think what happened was Jugmeat was feeling a little bit of pressure because the original deadline was the end of 2023. Um, and then that got bumped to March. And I think his constituents are saying, hey, you're laying down and taking it like a bitch from this Trudeau dog. So um, you got to stand up for this guy. You got to do something. Like you, I think he's like, okay, well, how do I sh build some confidence within, my, within, my, within the constituents of the NDP because I don't have any right now? So I think he just goes, look, I'm going to stand up to Trudeau and tell him this is my red line on my red line, right? I'm going to say, if you don't do this, this happens. But he, he left it open-ended. He's like, they have to have a bill. They have to have something. So as long as he goes, I've seen something and I'm happy with it. We're moving in the right direction. It's a win. That's all he needs, right? You know, it's just, it's, it's, it's posturing. And it is crazy too, because, you know, talking about it being $30 billion, it's like our Budget. annually yeah our 2020 budget was 462 billion and then so you're looking at what what's that a seven or eight percent increase in in budget right there alone i, th I think uh yeah i think our budget's closer to 600 billion though now oh really jeez i could i could be off but i think we're i think we're getting dangerously close to that number if you look at their forecast versus how they're going over and then you look at like this current fiscal yeah i think we're i think we're much closer to 600 but what's so crazy is that people when it comes to public sector stuff is they'll look at spending like that and say well it's just it's just a drop in the bucket but then if you look at it from say a business perspective tell me any business that could see their bottom line get uh get shattered by five percent and then just be like oh yeah that's nothing you're like, no, when, when you're operating on this scale of things, 5% is a massive number. Yeah. I mean, for me, the biggest thing is if you look at it in terms of cost for Canadians, right? So if you take 30 billion and then you go, okay, that's an annual, there's 40 million Canadians, right? So what's that work out to like $750 per Canadian extra? Dude, it's it's every every time we turn around, it's an extra. So okay, so the carbon tax, an extra seven hundred dollars per per household. And now you look at this, an extra seven hundred and fifty dollars, and you're like, well, it's going to do this or that, or we're taking things from here and there. It's like, no, look, every time you turn around, it's something else that's costing you three hundred, five hundred, seven hundred. Groceries are going up another seven hundred dollars this year, and you kind of go, that's seven hundred bucks, no big deal. Yeah, but do that fucking twenty times a year, and it becomes incredibly substantial. So it's like they look at this, and it does seem like a drop in the bucket, except. They've just had the tap on full this whole time with with problem after problem after problem and changed a policy that just keeps costing more and more and more. So it's not about the one policy. It's about the bad habit they have, right? This is $30 billion per year. And you can imagine that this will increase, right? Because if they're covering the cost of the goods from the pharma companies, then that means you know that there's, there's a big margin in between that A, is going to someone in the government. They're making money off this for sure. Like I said, I think 10% of our dollars get used efficiently. And then additionally, pharma companies are just going to charge more. They're going to go, oh, well, we'll just charge you American prices. Fuck it. You know what I mean? So it's just, it's just going to happen because you don't have to... If you and I go out and we need to buy cold medication, you and I will look at the prices and we'll buy accordingly so there's competition. If there's no competition and this is just everything's behind a paywall covered by the government, what do you think is going to happen? It, everything's just going to cost more. And everything then just going to come more money's going to come out of taxpayer dollars. This is 30 billion year one. I think it's actually closer to 20 billion. I should chill the fuck out. I think it's closer to 20 billion year one, but I think they're forecasting it going up. I think it's 30 billion by the second or third year. And I think you see this turn into 50 billion, you know, before the end of this, before the end of the 20s. The idea of just thinking that spending money will fix issues, just throwing money at the wall is, is going to make all these problems go away. It's just asinine because even like in October of 2022, the average wait time in an emergency room was 23 hours. And you're going, okay, there's obviously some system issues in place here right now that it's not just a financial issue. It's the way that you guys are operating things. And again, bringing it back to a business perspective, if you, if you're, every time something goes wrong, something gets bottlenecked in your operations, if your idea is just to throw money at that issue, it, you're going to go bankrupt in no time. Like you actually have to change the way that the things are operating, not just more money, more money, more money. And I think the problem you have in Canada is, and in most governments around the world, to be honest with you, is that the dollars are used so inefficiently and they just go to support broken systems where people are getting paid to keep it going. It's the bureaucracy. It's the Purnell's ironclad law bureaucracy. It's all it is. People are just doing whatever they can to keep the system alive so they can keep their job. It's like the homeless problem in California. You know, it's it's the amount of money they throw at that every year continues to increase and homelessness continues to increase. There's no solutions.
And then you also look at this, like they, the, you try to overhaul a lot of these things and, you know, they argue, oh, well, it's going to be cheaper to patch it up than just redo the whole thing. It's like, look, down the road, no, it's not. But this is the problem with four-year politics, right? The economy, the country, it needs a 40, 50-year plan, like a business. If you run your business, you know, where like if you'd make a decision that doesn't work well for you and you could lose your job, like a prime minister could, you know, have a vote called on them. You know, then you're doing things every day just to keep yourself alive. You're not doing what's best for the country. The system itself is faulty from the top down. So, again, yes, I, I blame the politicians, um, but equally, I blame the system that they're that they're playing in. You know what I mean? And I don't know how. I hate to say this because I always want to have a solution. I just don't know how you fix it. Like you can replace Trudeau with Polyev. You can even bring in Malay from Argentina. You know what I mean? But the thing is, like, he's already running into roadblocks. I just don't know how we solve these problems because the system we're working within is so damaged. It's a bleak, it's a bleak perspective, but I am kind of of the mind where you can't change the system once it gets this large, once it has its claws in so many different areas. It's one of those things where it's it's so tumorous at this point that you can't just get in there with a fine scalpel and cut these tumors out. It's like the host is going to die. Right. And it's just, it's and I mean, all throughout history, it seems like this is kind of that cycle. If you look at times, it goes, you know, people rally against, say, the, the system. It, it gets too oppressive, too large. It crumbles. People are happy because they have, they feel like a di they've got a little bit more control over their lives. Then their lives don't get all that much better. So they start looking for somebody to fix their problems. And then they start giving more power to the government. They go, can you fix our problems? And then the government, start, now that that idea is propagating, the government then just starts getting larger and larger until the whole the cycle just starts and repeats and repeats. Yeah, the problem that I have with how society works today is... I don't know how it falls and rebuilds. I don't know what that looks like. The only thing I can think of, and this is this is not great, um, is that it gets so bad that people people want to have a more unified global government because the one that you're operating within is so damaged and so broken that salvation is found with, hey, we're going to run a leaner infrastructure from the top down on a global level. Don't worry, we're going to clean these things up. We're only, we're going to cut down like, hey, we're going to share resources and share human resources. I mean, you know, we're going to knock this down so your government's only a quarter of the size and we're going to save you taxpayer dollars. And you know what? People are going to sign up for it. And then you know what the problem with that is? It's going to be good for about 10 years. And then it's going to start going down a really bad line. And then at that point, at that point, that's it. That's the end of the game. There's no way out if you've got a globalized, if you've got a unified government under one system operating, whether it be a democracy or, or how, whatever political system is in place, you all know where they end up, right? So I don't know. I mean, I just literally thought of that right now. So I know it's not a complete thought, but I could definitely see it going that way. In Klaus Schwab's Great Reset book, he talks about how there's three aspects, which is national sovereignty, democracy, and globalism. And he says that we're entering a world where only two of those things can continue to exist. And so, you know, you look at your options there, it's either the national sovereignty goes and you have democracy on a global scale, although I disagree with the idea that that can even happen. Uh, then you get rid of democracy and you've got dictatorships on a national level or you get rid of the, or and then you get rid of globalism yeah, you have and you have national sovereignty and democracy. So to me, I look at that and go, let's get rid of globalism. Yeah, easy, that's <laughs> an easy one, yeah, let's go. Well, but, in, in two, that's even, I'm not saying that there wouldn't be shockwaves from that happening. Again, we've even seen what happens when these supply chains get disrupted on a global scale like even what's happening in the red sea right now although that doesn't affect north america all that much mostly just europe and asia inflation but, yeah inflation oil costs stuff like that minor sure. though minor by comparison yeah but then or even just what happened during covid or what could happen let's say in taiwan and then all of a sudden the west doesn't have access to uh microchips uh, and semiconductors and stuff as as easily as they do and we can't produce technology like we do but i don't think there's any path that doesn't come with extreme road uh, road bumps yeah no I, I agree i think no matter what you do it's going to be you're jumping out of a plane it's going to be a hell of a ride on the way down you know i i get it the thing is and 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 to that point you have to build your wings on the way down you have to figure it out that's how it's going to be. I totally agree with you. I just feel like when you kind of look at those three things, <clears throat> I think that 
the hardest one to shake is going to be globalism because of the high the the number of elite individuals both politically and from a corporate perspective that benefits so much from the system that's in place and they have such a disproportionate amount of power and and an ability to sort of change what's happening in the world versus people like you and I on an individual level that I mean I can't see it going away no. I, re I really can't yeah. I, I want to there's but I just, I just can't see it yeah there's too much incentive to yeah keep it I it feel is. like there's going to be great little pockets and that may be where people like you and I end up where we go to places where we're like hey okay well you know, we'll um, we'll move to a small country that maybe we can have that kind of life. You know, I don't. I pick Costa Rica as example. To be honest with you, I don't know enough about it, but I know it just comes up all the time in conversation with people. But like you and I go to a Costa Rica, you know what I mean? And it kind of redevelops, and you kind of live off the land. You have a bit of an easier, simple life. And maybe that's maybe that's where people like you and I end up. I don't know because if Klaus Schwab's if Klaus Schwab's right, and you and I know this is going to kind of be a bumpy transition. I think what I'm saying makes the most sense. I think you're going to lose, I think you're going to fool people into losing national sovereignty for a more globalist government, probably an East and a West or something like that. And then you're going to live under this facade of democracy, which I, I agree with you, total disaster. If something like that happens, like I said, I'll be in Costa Rica or some, I don't know, maybe I'll move to Mars. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I, I, I won't want to be a part of this. Uh, unfortunately, to, to just sort of wrap it up, the system can't continue operating this way, right? And it's just going to continue to get worse and worse because it is it is a runaway train that is just killing more passengers as it continues. And the only way to change it is to implement one of those things. And I just don't see any other way around it. I just don't know how long it takes. I don't know what the runway looks like. Yeah, unfortunately, I agree with you. <laughs> uh, Damn. <all> right. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. <laughs> this Ooh. kind of heads into that idea of getting rid of, say, something like national sovereignty, though. So Elon Musk's accusation about Biden's immigration policy, which is he is accusing Biden of deliberately allowing illegal immigrants into the U.S. to secure a lasting Democratic majority, sparking a broader discussion on immigration strategies. Musk alleges Biden's border approach aims to admit as many illegal immigrants as possible and then subsequently giving them voting rights for a perceived one-party state. The Biden administration faces Republican opposition to legislative efforts for citizenship as illegal border crossings reach record levels. Critics claim lack security for political gain, while Biden denies these allegations, accusing Republicans of politicizing the border crisis. So is Musk right with his characterization of the border crisis? Interesting. Interesting. So I think it's pretty clear that the the liberal the the western liberal strategy is open borders just look anywhere you want in the west it's exactly what's happening now i did a little bit of research on this and there's a study done from 1980 to 2012 and that study done basically said i'm going to i don't want to skew this so but it, the idea was for every percentage increase in immigration um, you have a decrease of 0.42% in republican votes i know this is us but this was done over 42 years this was this was six election cycles i think it said um, so, you know, when you, when you look at that, you kind of go, huh, so it's just a numbers game. That's really what it is. If you just look at the data, if you look at the facts. So I think the big thing is how would something like this apply to Canada, right? So when you look at it here, <laughs> I mean, it's not so different, right? You know, um, the liberal government won, you know, the last two elections in a minority, but did not have the majority of votes, which means I think it was 5.7 million to about 5.5 million votes in favor of the conservatives. So you already know the liberals are like, okay, uphill battle. And we've seen the liberals decline in support substantially since 2021. Uh, in every poll, Trudeau's losing. You know, he's almost close as, he's clo he's close to the NDP in some, in some polls, which is pretty wild, right? So you go, okay, they're already fighting an uphill battle because they weren't winning enough votes. Now they're, now they're way lower. Now they got to, now this is a crazy, like, how are they going to fight through this? So then you go, okay, well, look at immigration. Well, last year we set a record by letting almost 1.4 million immigrants into the country. So when you look at that, you kind of go, huh, Western playbook, Western liberal playbook, jack up immigration, use them for votes. Now, there's a couple caveats, I'll say. You know, for starters, you don't get to just come to Canada and vote. You know, um, you have to be here for three of five years. You have to pass some tests and you have to file some taxes. That's how you become a Canadian citizen. That being said, what are Trudeau and Jagmeet Singh doing in the background right now? electoral reform so there is a chance now i this I'm, I'm out on a limb here so i want people to know that this is purely speculative i'm just guessing but there is a chance if biden is implementing legislation that will allow new immigrants to vote 
It's not so far-fetched to believe that Trudeau and Singh, who have a coalition, who have a majority between the two of them, would implement similar policy. And the reason I say that is because we know, based on statistics, these votes will only help the Liberals or the NDP, primarily because they're the ones bringing people into this country. So what does this look like? Well, Trudeau's got another year and a half of bringing more immigrants in, and 2024 is supposed to be another record year. So if you look at his run, how many people he's going to have led in the country since 2021, I mean, if he runs his full four years, it could easily be like four, five million people, which is fucking wild. Now, if even half of those people have the opportunity to vote, depending how they, they shake out the legislation, and we know that the liberals only lost, they, they lost by 200,000 votes, right, last time. Now, argument's sake, you could say, well, they'll lose by a million, maybe two. But now you add all these immigrants, you add the immigrants in, and then you go, wait a minute, now this is a very, very close race. So, I mean, I don't know. Like, I, again, I know, I know I'm taking a, I know this is a guess. I don't know, but this could shake out pretty dark for Canada. Um, and this could be the strategy that a lot of these Western governments use to sort of maintain this one-party democratic rule. Well, and nothing says democracy like one party, right? <laughs> <laughs> but just to put into perspective the insanity of these numbers, so these, these numbers are coming from the U.S. Customs and Border Patrol, is that before 2020, there was less than 500,000 illegal encounters annually. In 2021, that number rose to 1.7, so a 300% increase, over a 300% increase. Uh, in 2022, it became 2.3 million, and then in 2023, 2.4 million. So you look at that and you go, there's zero chance that things scale up at that level that quickly without there being some sort of incentive in place for people. Like, And, and it's, it's crazy that... Even Biden recently blamed Donald Trump for the border crisis. And you're like, what the hell? Like the, the, the encounters at the border were going down throughout his, his presidency. And I think up until 2019, 2019, they rose again. But then, yeah, like to, to do absolutely nothing, to get in the way of Texas putting anything in place at their border, and then to blame it on your political opposition is just absolute madness. Well, it's gaslighting, right? And, yeah. and what's interesting is the, the piece of legislation that they were putting through, and I don't know where they landed, so it just got voted down in the Senate. It didn't pass. But what they were floating was, hey, we'll cap it at 5,000 people a day. So you're telling me 1.8 million approximately? Yeah. That's your number? Come on, guys. Like, you obviously know that there, if you don't have the infrastructure to manage these people and it is hurting your economy and it is affecting the, the other people at home and no one's, it's not doing anybody any favors, why are we doing this? The only thing that makes sense is these guys are dragging in the polls and this is their opportunity to try to bolster it. And when you actually look at Canada versus the US, Canada brought in 1.4 million. That's such a substantial difference because how do you know how many people vote in the for 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 the president? Do you, do you, do you actually know the number? Like it's got to be probably what is it like uh, mid one hundred million? Sure. So call one one even even if just ballpark it and say one fifty, right? But if if so each so whoever wins is getting like seventy three to seventy five million votes, right? So you let in a few you let in a couple million people a year and you do you use that in comparison to the change in votes. And you go, okay, well, the uh, the existing base is still more important, right? But when you look at that number in Canada, well, if the winner's only getting 5.5 to 6 million votes, those 1 to 2 million people, that is incredibly significant. So I actually see this being a much a much heavier, um, this carries a lot more weight in Canada if this is the strategy that they're implementing. Now, again, I don't know that they'll be able to pass something like that because they do have to work through the House, which you know it'll sweep through, but they also have to work through the Senate and... I hope some of those people have their head on straight and go, no, like, why would we be doing this? There's only one reason that you would be doing this, and this doesn't make any sense for Canada. Hopefully they roadblock it, but I could totally see it happening. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, there's even there's even some darker predictions out there with what all of the illegal immigration facilitation is about as well. Brett Weinstein was recently on Tucker Carlson's show, and you know, I think it's important to note because it's very easy to get called, you know, a right wing person or whatever when talking about these kind of things. But Brett Weinstein worked at Evergreen. He was a professor at Evergreen, which is one of the most progressive colleges in America. And he self identifies himself as a progressive. But he went down to South America and tried to view the Darien Gap himself, which is where it, it's kind of this corridor in South America where all of these uh, illegal immigrants kind of mosey on through. Right. And how 
he was also saying a lot of these South American countries d- turn a blind eye to this kind of muling process essentially through their countries as long as they keep moving. Just don't stop here and we're cool with it. <laughs> and, <laughs> but he was saying too, he's, he was bringing up a much darker aspect that, you know, maybe this is one of those things where you grant people citizenship and it's not just a aspect of being able to drive up votes, but you can also get them into positions that would be necessary to enact, say, certain tyrannical policies, like in police forces or in armies or this kind of stuff. And he was very, he, he was making it very clear that this is just kind of a speculation of his, but it is one of those things too, where that's, that's, and that is on the table potentially. And you know, you say that kind of stuff and people will say that you're crazy, but then you can even go and look back in history and these things have been implemented before. So like the the Roman legions back in the day, they uh, they brought in Germanic people like from the Germanic tribes to then be able to go and weaponize against the Roman people because these people had no allegiances to the Roman people. That otherwise, they would feel like these armies would be uh, being weaponized against their own family and friends. And, they, and well, I have some patriotism towards my country or whatever, I can't do that. Whereas, you know, if you created that army, who knows? And they even just set a precedent in New York, didn't they, where it was the the first non-citizen police officer was uh, taken into the force. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. And so it's like, that's already kind of there. It's on the table. And yeah, and you just see what you just see what's being done at a certain level. There was just a Democratic senator actually just today that I was watching. And he was oh, actually I'll pull up this clip right now and show it to the negotiation didn't have a path to citizenship. It was entirely on their terms in order to get Ukraine funding, right? Well, I mean, Chris, that's been a failed play for 20 years. So you are right that that has been the Democratic strategy for 30 years, maybe. uh, And it has failed to deliver for the people we care about most, the undocumented Americans that are in this country. So you've got <laughs> you've got a Demo- a Democrat senator now saying the people we care about most are the undocumented in this country, and then look at what they're doing in some of these areas like New York. You're seeing them empty out schools, telling kids oh, that, that they wild. can't go to school. Yeah, that uh, I recently saw a clip of somebody. Uh, there was a African American community center that was being turned into migrant housing. And one of the guys from that community was standing out front at all these cops being like, why won't you let me in? Like you guys built this for, for us. And it's funny. You now see this essentially oppression Olympics taking place on a real stage where it goes, Oh yeah, we really care about say the African American community until there's undocumented people that uh, illegal migrants that they're bigger victims than you. So they actually take precedent. It's interesting actually, when you say that to just sort of watch this victim hierarchy change over time, because you and I are always the devil. So you and yeah, I are just yeah. like, <laughs> Oh, you threw someone else in there. All right, cool. <laughs> you know, it's just what it is, man. You just kind of deal with it. Like, well, whatever. I, I, I don't even care about that. I don't really let that stuff affect me too much, but it is interesting. Like, because we've created a culture where being a victim is valuable. Right. And a lot of people that don't want to take responsibility for their lives, they go, well, I'm a victim. It's not my fault. It's because of the system, it's because of colonization, it's because this, that's the way I was born. You're the problem. All right, whatever, cool. But when there's now someone else that's more of a victim and more of a victim and more of a victim, and now, you know, like you kind of look at that and you kind of go, I don't like the African American group, they're like, you know, fourth or fifth on the rung now. You know what I mean? You look at the LGBT communities, they're not, they're not first anymore either. So you're kind of like, it's going to create this, in my opinion, and I'm hopeful that this is what it does. I'm hopeful that it just starts cannibalizing itself. Yeah. You know, and then the system starts well, to is, fall apart. Sure. Yeah, because the thing is, this is how you start waking people up. When the government, because the thing is, these these cultural, these changes in culture are primarily, or a lot of it is driven by the media and by the government. They're the ones that sort of bolster these things or give them a push or they pitch the narrative, right? So when you start seeing like, okay, now the the new migrants or so the refugees are the lowest on the rung in terms of, or the highest on anyone, victimhood, sure, right? They're in first place. So then you look at all these other communities that have been the victims. Now- I say, I, I blanket that. I know a lot of people in these communities don't act that way, so I don't mean it like that. I mean the ones that do. They're going to start getting up in arms, and they're going to start being pissed off because they're going to go to the government, the people that were their support network, that were saying, hey, you're the victim, you deserve this and that and whatever, and they're not going to be there for them anymore. 
And so what those people are going to do, hopefully, is they turn around and go, oh, the government isn't on my side. They are not going to help me, and I do need to do something for myself, and things need to change. And maybe, just maybe, if they continue at this high level of immigration, it's going to piss off enough of these other groups that are in the victimhood categories that they're going to push back, and this ends up blowing up in their face. And they start losing that that base. Because I think a lot of that's happening here in Canada, where a lot of people that are that are moderate, not, not, not full left-wing, a lot of people that are moderate now will not vote for Trudeau. And immigration is a big reason why. So it's interesting to see how this may end up actually working against them in the long run, just sort of as a mis by, like sort of a miscalculation or they, they over-leveraged it, you know what I mean? Just kind of go, I don't know, we'll bring in as many as we can when it's like, hey, if you were more calculated, this would have worked out better. But It's interesting too when, say, these communities or even the social justice types will hold up certain... Uh, famous figures in high esteem like for instance malcolm x but then you go back and listen to malcolm x and he was not a fan of these types of people that tried to push these victim narratives so he once made the analogy that republicans are like wolves they'll just show you their teeth you know that they don't like you but then the white liberals are like foxes. They'll they'll play friendly with you for a minute. They'll trap you. And then it's when you're not looking is when they'll attack you. It's once that you, they've gained your trust. And so... Dark. Yeah. <laughs> but it's true. Yeah, I think I've it's read or heard something it's about like, that. It's like, yeah. we're going to use you in, until we have no more use for you. And we're going to get what we're going to get what we want out of you. And then... As soon as we get that, you're just you're in the dirt. That's exactly how it's gone. It's interesting. Like, it's interesting to to, to hear that, especially from back then, because it seems that they've used the same playbook for a very long time. That being said, I don't know the conservative playbook well enough to know if they do the, some of the same things. Well, I think an interesting perspective is, you know, Republican uh, Republican politicians will sit on a stage and take these hard stances against, say, stuff like illegal immigration. But the people that are putting the Republicans in the in office, the high donors, the very that are tossing a lot of money around in this space, you don't think they're a fan of cheap labor? Yeah, but the other thing too is when you get to that level, you gotta understand they're funding both sides too. Yeah. Right. So they they don't care. Like they're controlling the system a lot more than but yeah, I mean But it's that it, again, it goes to that idea of illusion of choice. Right. It's like Yeah, yes. Yeah. yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I think I think one thing you can consider, and I think this is a big reason why no one wants Trump in in the United States, is there is an establishment. There is a there is quote unquote the establishment and it's very well understood right now that Nikki Haley's a part of it, right? So they're kind of going, well, if you vote for Nikki Haley, you're basically just voting voting for another Biden. And it's not about Republican or Democrat. It's about, well, these people will toe the line. And it's interesting for me because I have never seen, I have in, in my in my short career paying attention to these things so deeply, you know, over the last five, seven years, I've never seen this where the party, like Vivek, Trump, DeSantis, everyone has turned on Nikki Haley and they're like, she's a, she's just a part of the system. You don't want to vote for her. They're basically saying, hey, like, I've never seen them identify that. I've never been like, hey, we're all like, you know, usually it's, well, it's Republicans or it's Democrats and we're not on the same team. And they're like, no, 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 no. She, she's on the same team as these guys. And I've, I've just never seen that sort of cross party um, exposure, if that makes sense. I know I'm kind of butchering the idea. I don't know if you know what I'm trying no, to say. Yeah, no, I know what you're saying. I, I agree that it is kind of the the false alliance is, is being shattered. Mm -hmm. Well, and maybe it is because there is started starting to get some outsiders into those areas before, if you look back 10, 20 years, 30 years ago, there was no outsiders. There was nobody taking anti-establishment lines, but now that we have access to a lot of information, that is, you know, people boogeyman it as, as populism playing to the populist idea. But you are starting to see some of that come up where it's, hey, you know, these systems aren't working in your favor and we're here to try to fight against the system on your behalf. Yeah. That wasn't necessarily a thing that you would see on a debate stage before. So I don't, I think it's more so that it's... 20, 30 years ago, they were all just, they were all just Nikki Haley's. Yeah. No, I mean, that's actually a really good point. I agree with you. I think the one thing I'll give Trump credit for is that he did bring that, he brought the, he brought that option into play. He brought the, the reality that you could push back against these, the establishment of the system and maybe you could make a change. And that seems to be the way of the Republican party these days, which is good, you know, not for nothing. Like I'm not a big supporter of Trump and, and the, the type of individual he is. 
Um, but I have to give him credit there. Like for sure. Like that's, I don't, yeah, I'm not a fan of Trump either because I think you look at even just, he said he was going to walk in there and drain the swamp and you go, you had four years and you did nothing meaningful. It seems to me that he has this idea where he can just put certain people in place at the top of these institutions, whether it be the FBI, it's like, oh, the FBI is a problem. But if I just put somebody that's aligned with my interests at the top of the FBI, then that fixes the problem of the FBI. Yeah. And I mean, I think what happened happened though was Trump got in with that idea and then realized what the how the system's actually built. So I think this is another one of those things where he did try to do that. Now he did bring people into his party that were not aligned with his vision. That was his own stupidity um on that particular issue, but he did get in there and he did try to make those changes, but I think both he and the Americans figured out two things. First of all, holy shit, this this whole establishment is gentrified and you cannot break it down if you want to as one individual person. I think yeah. they learned that. But the other thing they realized is that you can actually get in there and try to, you can try to shake it up and look how they treated Trump. They ostracized him. They tried to impeach him. They did all these other things. So all that says to the people, they go, oh, this is real. This is yeah. a very real thing and we need to try to make a change. So now he it's at least like- exposes them. Yeah, it's like I don't it's think like he did anything two. to. I don't think no. he did anything meaningful to get in their way. No. But I think he did expose them. Actually, Vivek is great at talking in sound bites, and he has he had a, he had a good sound bite where he was saying that Trump walked in and flipped the log over and showed all the termites, and he said, "I'm bringing the pesticide." Yeah, perfect. So, but it is one of those things where it's like, okay, now it's at least in the open. Yeah. Now you understand how these things operate. I don't think Trump was the guy to deal with those. I don't think he is again either. But I think it's kind of like you think about it like. The way I see trying to break this system down is think about it like a, a 10 to 12 round boxing match. That's kind of what it is. The first round you get in there and you feel out your opponent, you see what they're made of. That's what Trump did. He kind of showed us what they're capable of, what their tools are and what's going on. Now you got to get in there now that you have that understanding and now you have to now take a bit more of an offensive and try to fight back. But again, you know, I think it's going to take a lot longer and I really don't think Trump is the guy that's going to make the substantial difference. However, you talk about flipping over the log. I can see him rolling it over a few times, a few times while he's in there. This time, stepping on a few termites, making a bit of a, a bit of a change, and then again propelling the American people into the understanding, like, hey, we can maybe make some changes here if we do take this anti deep state, anti sort of establishment approach. So maybe, maybe for them, maybe for them, there's hope. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, all right, last up here for today, the UN says melting Arctic ice is a key indicator of climate change, despite it not actually melting. So the IPCC fo forecast, which is the Intercontinental uh, Panel on Climate Change, forecasts an ice-free Arctic by September 2050 due to escalating CO2 emissions, contradicting a 2013 prediction that all Arctic ice would melt by 2033. However, Danish uh, researcher Alan Jensen challenges this, revealing near-zero Arctic sea ice declines between 2007 and 2023. Jensen contends that recent trends undermine CO2-centric explanations. So what he went on to show was that throughout the... Um, 19, for at seven, 1979, CO2 concentrations were 337 parts per million, and the ice extent was 2.72 million square miles. By 1996, so 20 years later, CO2 was at 362 parts per million, but the minimum ice increased to 2.93 million square miles. So over that 20-year period, the ice levels rose as well alongside CO2 levels rising. Then the opposite happened from 1996 to 2007, where ice declined while uh, CO2 raised again. So this is kind of one of those periods that people will point to a lot and say, well, look, CO2 went up and the ice levels went down. But then as he points out, Again, from 2007 to 2023, uh, ice declines remained close to zero, almost no statistical change in the ice levels, but the CO2 levels rose to 421 parts per million. So a massive increase in CO2 and next to no decline. Actually, there was, it was a slight incline. Uh, so there was no decline in ice levels during that period. So it just kind of shatters the whole narrative that CO2 is directly linked to the warming and the ice caps. Yeah, 
I mean, it's interesting because I think this is a bit isolated in terms of climate change, but they do use this as a mountain to scream from, right? They go, oh, the ice is melting, we're all going to die. Oh, the sea levels are raising and everything's going to be underwater. Um, it, it's interesting that that this one point doesn't seem to be as correlated to CO2 um, as some other things, you know what I mean? Of, of course, and look, I'm not denying that the climate's changing, it's always changing, but it's interesting, actually, in the month of December, they had the largest amount of growth there, like the in the top three, over the last 45 years, just in that month alone. So obviously, there's more to this. I think what it points to is the fact that the climate is not linear. And there's more than one thing affecting what's going on at scale. And so when they try to simplify this and use one enemy, carbon, um, they're just wrong. They're, they're, they're using it as their, they're using it as their megaphone to implement policy and change at scale. That is, that is the boogeyman of the day, right? Because we didn't really think about it when there's, a, when there's another bigger, more important reason, like the pandemic, we don't really talk about the climate. Um, but now they needed something else to scream about. And this seems to be it, right? Um, but when, when you look at, you know, again, I, I've, I've said this before, when you look at a lot of the climate science, a lot of it, is is a little faulty and what i what i just what i ask for anybody that's really well educated on this and I, I have a you know i've talked to a few people about it i just said look if you can just give me unequivocal evidence if you can just prove to me a hundred percent that it's 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 all it's it's humans faults and we need to change these things or these things are going to happen and they don't have an answer for it they actually can't and i think there's 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 two reasons why first of all um i think that our impact is much less significant than we're told but the second and the bigger reason is because this isn't a simple th this isn't a simple equation. It's not it's not going to be that easy to figure it out and just say oh it's this one thing and here are the effects because as we know if you just take CO2 you know and and I'm a bit of an idiot but if you just take CO2 and you correlate that to declining ice levels, right? But when you have higher levels of CO2 you have more vegetation growth globally. So just when you when you just look at the cause and effect of the corollary of that increasing just on that one thing you kind of go how can you tell me that this 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 co2 level is the end all and be all and this is the answer we need to we need to reduce it and i think all this does again i think all this does is poke a hole in that narrative and then hopefully pushes people that are more intelligent than i am in the scientific community to do to do more research and to understand that this is an integrated problem and to try to give society a better more comprehensive answer because the one we're getting we know is bullshit, and this just highlights it. Well, and I've pointed out before how the climate actually cooled from 1940 to 1970, which doesn't make too much sense if everything is about CO2, because that was one of the greatest expansions in industrialization in human history, if not the most. And I had somebody push back against that saying, well, yep, aerosol per, uh, use was also extremely prevalent at that time, and aerosol has a cooling effect on the atmosphere. And then I dug into that and I said, okay, maybe, maybe that does explain away my, my understanding of things. But then I looked into it and they didn't end up doing any real limitations or policies on aerosol reduction until about like the late 18 or sorry, late 1980s or early 1990s. That's when they started kind of moving on that. So you go, okay, well, they, the climate started shifting in the other direction before they started reducing aerosol. So it just, again, it's just these things just don't line up as neatly as they make it seem. No, no, I agree. I think one other thing that that people should consider when they look at this is, you know, how long they've been tracking the Arctic ice. So they've been tracking it since the 70s, right? And they say, okay, 70s to, you know, 96, slight increase, you know, or s small change. 96 to 2007, massive decrease, hike in CO2, relatively the same from 2007 to, to 2023, what about 70 years before that? What about in from the 1900s, the 1910s, the 20s, the 30s, the 40s? It's like they, they go, well, look, this is overall, guys, this has been a big decline. So don't pay attention to the last 17 years. Pay attention to what it's done over the last 50, 60 years. It's like, okay, but what did it do over the last 150? Because there are ebbs and flows in this. There's like, we even know there are four seasons in, in Toronto. Like, you know that this is cyclical. Even a great example is look at Egypt. Egypt right now is a desert almost through and through. Yeah. They're not doing any crazy agricultural productions, anything like this. But go back to ancient Greece times. Egypt was essentially an agricultural hub. They were supplying the entire region with, uh, with, with wheat was their main uh, export, essentially. And so these things do naturally change. And you go, okay, well, what was the explanation for why Egypt turned into a desert over 2,000 years ago? 
Like, was it, if, if it wasn't CO2, then what was it? And whatever that is, is that at play right now? But no, that's not an acceptable conversation to have because it has to always be about CO2. Yeah, I think it's challenging. You know, when you look at what's happened, I was recently watching this documentary um, that was explaining, Morgan Freeman was was narrating it. And it was kind of explaining the the history of the earth. It's interesting. You know, they had to make some stuff up and make some assumptions, but it was it was well done. Um, but you look at what has happened to the Earth over the last four or five billion years, as long as it's been around, right? Um, and you look at you look at how it's gone through different ice ages and changes, and it's been a hotbed, it's been cold, it's been uninhabitable, all these other things, and it's given life to so many. It's had all these different extinction level events, and you you look at all this, you kind of go billions of years. We're trying to pretend like we understand what's going on because we're tracking the last 70 or 80 years when this thing's been around for billions of years. Guys, come on. We're, we're a drop in a bucket in an ocean. That's all this is. Like we, we have no real idea. This thing is so much more significant. It can do so much more on its own and has so much more of its own history. I just think it's foolish to be like, well, we've got it all figured out. Like what a fucking humanistic thing to do, eh? Humans and scientists, we've got all the answers today. Guys, 10 years from now, you're going to say we were idiots 10 years ago for the things we were thinking. Obviously, this is just the way it goes. And for them to be like, well, for the last 70 years, this is what's happening. We've got it all figured out. No, you don't. You don't. I'm sorry. No, you don't. Obvi obviously, based on this information from today, no, you don't. And I think something important to point out is I think the reason they keep putting their predictions so far out into the future is so that they can implement things now to deal with these, these issues that will take place 50, 100 years from now. But they very well understand that 50 to 100 years from now, you're going to forget about the predictions they made today and not be able to measure against. So look at like even the executive director of the UN in 1982 said, inaction will cause by the turn of the century, meaning 2000, an ecological catastrophe which will witness devastation as complete, as irreversible as any nuclear holocaust. It's like, well, we're still here 24 years later. David Vinner, the uh, senior research scientist in 2000, said, Within a few years, winter snowfall in the UK will become a very rare and exciting event. Children just aren't going to know what snow is. And then a Pentagon report in 2004 said, European cities will be plunged beneath rising seas as Britain is plunged into a Siberian climate by 2020. You're like... It just changes all this. What I mean, like they've they've continued to tell us the world is going to end every ten years since like the fifties. This is what they do. This is just their strategy. I mean, this particular issue alone, they said that the the UN said the Arctic ice would be gone by twenty fifty, right? That's they said no more ice, except you know ten years ago they said it'd be gone by twenty thirty three. So they just jumped that. And I know I forget the exact date, so I'm not going to reference it. But I know there was another one before that where there should already be no ice in the Arctic, right? So this just ongoing bullshit narrative with no strong science. And now we look at the actual data and we go, oh, it's the complete opposite of what you're saying. Cool story, bro. All right. Anything else you wanted to add for today? No, that's it. Uh, thanks for listening, everyone. Well, if you did enjoy today's episode, don't forget to head over to our website, blendernews.com, B-L-E-N-D-R news.com to sign up for our newsletter. All right. We'll catch you later. Bye, everybody.